I'm Eric Duran. I'm a principal business development manager based out of Seattle. Um, I spend my time um, working with customers and with our service teams around our storage services, primarily our object storage services. So today, I'm going to start off our presentation um, talking about Snowball, uh, which you saw hopefully some announcements this morning at the keynote. Um, and then I'll be handing it off to Tom Johnston, uh, who is a product manager on our S3 team to talk about the S3 Transfer Accelerator. So AWS Storage um, services customers out of any uh, number of verticals, as well as multiple sizes of customers. We have enterprise customers like Dow Jones and Autodesk, um, media customers like Scripps Network Interactive, who um, hosts or who owns media properties uh, like Food TV Network and the Travel Channel, um, Novartis, Illumina, and Philips for healthcare. Um, and all of these customers, what they have in common is that they're really using um, AWS storage as a platform for staging their data and making their data available to the applications and the services that they leverage inside of AWS. So these types of storage really can entail um, file storage, which you might find as an analog for NAS on-prem. You find with our Elastic File Store, EFS. Um, Block, which you would find as an analog for SAN on-prem, uh, is our elastic, elastic, elastic Block Store, EBS, as well as, uh, of course, what's near and dear to my heart, our object storage platforms um, with Amazon S3, which is highly scalable, um, high throughput, low latency, access to um, massively scalable storage, as well as Glacier, which is our archival storage platform, which also happens to be an object store. However, as powerful as these services are, and as useful as they can be in building your applications, they're not particularly useful unless you can get data into and out of them quickly. Um, so if you've noticed there's been a theme here today, is that we have continued to add new means, new services, and new features to enhance the tools that you have as a customer for getting data into and out of AWS. So we, for some time, have had AWS Direct Connect, enabling you to have a direct high throughput connection, high throughput low latency connection um, through an ISP into, an, into AWS. Uh, we have also brought features um, like Amazon Kinesis, which allows you to, um, and now Kinesis Firehose as a managed service variant of Kinesis, to enable you to easily put streaming data into S3. At reInvent last year, we launched Snowball um, and continue to make more announcements about that today, which I'll be talking about, as well as uh, we have our storage gateway platform, which enables you to leverage uh, S3 and Glacier um, in a hybrid fashion as, as on-premise block storage, um, but with the scale and the availability and durability of our object store. And then finally, um, our many, many partners, um, our ISV partners, our independent software vendor partners who, have offer, who offer a number of integrated solutions for leveraging our storage on-premise for both production and backup workloads. So the first method I, I want to talk about of the two that we're going to talk about today is, is, is literally the highway, right? Um, the joke was said this morning during the keynote. Right, that oftentimes it's faster to move your data via truck. Well, and that's true. Um, since we've launched Snowball at reInvent last year, so last fall, we've seen hundreds of customers um, successfully use the service to move massive data sets in record time um, into AWS. And so we're very pleased to announce uh, available today is a new 80 terabyte version of the Snowball. The original device was 50 terabytes and is still available in our uh, initial regions of US West Oregon and US East Virginia. Um, but they're now complemented by the 80 terabyte model, which holds 60% more data um, and has a price point of $250 per job. So that's a data transfer job or a one-time use of the snowball for import or export. The 50 terabyte continues to be available in the two existing regions um, at $200 per job. And then I'm very excited to announce there's been, you know, I've talked with a lot of customers all over the world who have wanted Snowball. And so I'm very, very excited to announce that um, as of today, Snowball is now available in our US West 1 Northern California region, in GovCloud here in the US, um, as well as our first international expansions 
um, with Snowball being introduced in the Asia Pacific region, uh, specifically in Australia and our Sydney region, and uh, in the EU, um, in, in Europe, in our Dublin region, in Ireland, servicing all customers that are in member nations of the EU. Sorry, just my microphone here. Um, additionally, we have committed to rolling out Snowball to all of our regions worldwide, including new regions, um, by the end of this year. So if you haven't had the chance to go see the Snowball itself in person um, down at our AWS booth on the, on the show floor, please do stop by. Um, but I have a lovely picture of it here. This is um, the Snowball. So the Snowball's really been designed to be petabyte scale data transport. Um, and that, that statement really rings true. We have customers that have moved petabytes of data using multiple snowballs in concurrence in order to facilitate, facilitate moving these massive data sets in weeks. Um, but the, the device itself is also very exciting. It's the first time that AWS has created our own hardware that we're shipping out to customers to be used on-prem. It's built in a ruggedized case. It's roughly that high. Um, it, the ruggedized case can stand eight and a half Gs of impact. So what that practically means is it can, it can um, fall more than two stories without suffering any damage. Please don't do that, though. Um, that's really just there for the shipping company, not for you. Um, the e, it has a Kindle built in, an e-ink display. The Kindle services both as the shipping label, um, automatically populating the ship to information, as well as the return shipping information, so nothing for you to do there. Um, as well as services as the touchscreen interface for configuring the IP address on the device, as well as providing status about the device. And as I mentioned, it now comes in a 50 and an 80 terabyte uh, variants, and it supports both one gig and 10 gigabit networking um, through copper and through SFP plus ports. The device, aside from being tamper, or aside from being rugged um, and being rain and dust resistant and ruggedized, it's also been designed with security top of mind. Um, the case itself is custom built to be tamper resistant with custom hardware. It has tamper evidence seals built into the case that are inspected at every use, as well as it has a TPM, a trusted platform module, that actually does an inspection on the firmware of the device every time it's booted to ensure nothing's been compromised. Um, and then finally, all data is always encrypted before it's ever written to the snowball. This way, by keys that you as a customer actually create and manage using our key management system, KMS. And this ensures that all of your data is transported securely um, in the event that the, the device was lost or stolen. So how the service works, like all of our services, it's console driven. And so all you need to do is simply go into the AWS console, logging in under the account that you want to, that has access to the buckets that you want to import or export data from or to. You click on AWS Snowball, and in there you create a data transfer job. In that data transfer job, it's very simple to create. You simply tell us which bucket or buckets we're going to be transferring data from. You tell us where to ship the device. You tell us which KMS key to use, which KMS key to use, um, or create a new one. And then you simply submit the job. The device will be shipped to you within one business day at the location you specified, and also at the shipping speed that you specify. So that's either one day or two day, and all shipping is done by UPS currently. Once you receive the device, simply open up the flaps. It comes with all the cables that you need, both power and network. Plug it in, connect it, boot it, and once it has an IP address, you will simply download our client software. So our client software is just a lightweight command line tool. It can be run on a Windows, Mac, or a Linux system. And that client software also takes advantage of what we call the manifest file. So what that manifest file is, is it's the bundle of metadata that you created when you created that job. So it has the KMS keys in it that'll be used for encryption. It has the certificates that are needed for secure uh, communication between the client and the snowball. It also has the uh, information about the S3 buckets that we'll be performing the data transfer job for. And so once you've connected to the, connected to the snowball, you simply use that client to copy the data out of all the various data sources that you'd like to move onto the device. And once you're done with that, you simply shut down the snowball and the return shipping information automatically updates on the, on the e-ink display on the Kindle. You ship that back to us via common carrier, UPS, either at one day or two day, which you've specified. And once we receive it, we have an automated ingest process. 
and we will ingest your data um, very quickly and give you notifications throughout the entire process. So as you see sort of there on the bottom of the screen, um, in the console you'll receive notifications throughout the entire process, providing a full chain of custody reporting to you. Um, you can also specify through our simple notification service, SNS, you can specify notifications so that you receive notifications throughout the entire process. So you can do this uh, to move both just use one snowball to move up to 80 terabytes, or you could use multiple snowballs in parallel to move petabytes of data. This whole process takes roughly a week. So what customer, So we launched Snowball at reInvent last year, um, and so over the last several months, we've had um, customers of all sorts of verticals using Snowball for a wide variety of use cases. The most common use case is just simply cloud migration of data. So the thought here is you have a large data set, it might be tens of terabytes, it might be petabytes of data that's on an existing data source, so some server you would like to shut down, um, some existing file, you know, a NAS array, something like that. And so what the Snowballs enabled these customers to do is to take these large existing data sets and to very quickly move them into AWS, specifically into S3, where it then can be staged to be used by our various other services. A great example of this is uh, Scripps Network Interactive. I mentioned them earlier. Um, so Scripps Network Interactive is a media company. They own a number of properties, including Home and Garden Television, Food Television Network, the Travel Channel. Um, and they provide highly interactive experience to their customers across these media properties. And so in order to help facilitate that, they've been using Snowball regularly now to move large data sets of existing media assets very quickly into S3, where then they utilize our various other services to uh, provide and extend that experience to their customers. Also complementing that uh, cloud migration uh, use case is use of export for disaster recovery. Um, so really two customers to talk about here that have done great things uh, improving their service offering, their existing service offerings with Snowball. So Zools um, is a platform for both backup and archive that runs on AWS. They specifically use Glacier on the back end for storage, and Zools offers a SaaS, a software as a service platform to their customers for backup and archive. So when we announced Snowball, they were very excited because they in turn were able to offer the Snowball service directly to their customers, both for the import, the initial import of large backup or archive data sets onto the Zools platform, as well as in the event of a disaster, they are able to allow their customers through the Zools platform to rapidly recover those data sets and having their data shipped to them on Snowball. Another customer is um, Philips, and so Philips Healthcare. And so Philips Healthcare um, has a, a, Philips Health Suite, pardon me, runs on AWS. Specifically, they're a very large consumer of our Glacier platform for um, the archival of patient data. So they have over 15 petabytes currently on Glacier, and they're growing at a pace of one petabyte per month. And so they have now um, are, have announced the use, or the announced a new offering to their customers, to the hospitals who are their customers, um, to use Snowball for a rapid data recovery service. And so what this service will enable their hospital customers to use is in the event of a disaster, and that they're storing their data in the healthcare, in the Philips Health Suite, they can now automatically provision a snowball to recover that data in a very short amount of time in order to avert that disaster. Uh, yet another uh, use case is data center decommissioning. And so these are for our customers that have decided to go all in on AWS and are now looking for a, an efficient means of getting out of their existing data center. Um, and so that could be you know, a fairly time intensive process if you have petabytes of data on an existing data center that you now need to move into the cloud. I'll be giving you some examples of the time this can take in, in a bit. Um, but so Dev Factory, who was recently spun off of Trilogy Software, um, is a uh, software development firm, and they've been in acquisitive mode, recently acquiring a number of companies in order to improve and add them to their software development firm. And so this has resulted in them in shutting down of the various data centers of the companies they've acquired. And so they've used Snowball to move over a petabyte of data successfully um, into AWS. And originally, this data, these, these two data center decommissionings was going to take them over six months. And they were able to shorten that process to under six weeks using Snowball 
saving them hundreds of thousands of dollars. And then finally, a, a number of our media and entertainment customers um, have been very excited about the prospect of using Snowball for content distribution, both for import and export, and the sharing of their content with both their customers and their business partners. So uh, a little over a month ago, um, Cloudberry, um, specifically for their Cloudberry backup software, announced integration with Snowball. And so what this enables their customers to do is to those customers that would initially like to seed a very large backup data, a data set, that it might take too long to do so over the wire, they're able to use the Cloudberry backup software now in conjunction with Snowball to write that data onto the Snowball appliance to seed that initial very large backup set. They can then ship that into AWS where it's stored for backup, and then all changes are able to be synchronized going forward directly over the wire using the Cloudberry backup client. Um, and so we're very excited about this announcement, and we love to see that our, our ISV partners are making these sort of innovations using our new services, and I expect more to come in the near future. So I often get the question, in fact, just even this morning being at the booth, I've got the question many times of, but why would I use Snowball if I have bandwidth? And it's a good question to ask. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm detailing here is if you look at the original capacity of the Snowball, the 50 terabyte device, let's say I needed to move 50 terabytes into AWS for one of the aforementioned use cases. Well, in most cases, what I found with customers is they've sized their bandwidth based upon their ongoing usage. So even when you want to do a large data transfer, you can't necessarily take advantage of that entire pipe for that data transfer. Typically, you can only use some smaller percentage of it. In the event that I, I, that I was a customer and I had a one, gigabyte, a one gigabit connection and I was able to use three quarters of it or 75% of it, I could move 50 terabytes in six days and I wouldn't need Snowball, and that's probably the best path to do. However, most customers end up on the other end of the spectrum where they're trying to move 50 terabytes or more and are either don't have that much bandwidth or don't have that much bandwidth available. Their circuit's high, more highly utilized, and they end up looking at weeks, if not months, to move that amount of data over the wire. This is why Snowball's been very popular. If you really look at it, larger data sets, so in this case, 250 terabytes, which is a very common use case for Snowball, that size data set, you can see, even with ample bandwidth, I'm still looking at a month, if not significantly longer, in order to move those larger data sets over my existing bandwidth, where with multiple Snowball devices, I could do this in roughly a week. So Snowball has been designed uh, with security is top of mind. So all data is encrypted on Snowball using the KMS keys that you create and manage in the KMS system. Um, and so all data is encrypted via 256-bit encryption prior to being written to the device. As I mentioned, those, are, those keys are managed by you, the customer, in KMS, and they are never sent to the Snowball. The Snowball will never have knowledge of those keys. We, have, we offer a very strong chain of custody, both through the console-based reporting of where your device is at any given time during the process, as well as through the simple notification service. And then the case has been designed to be tamper-resistant with custom hardware, with tamper-evident seals, um, as well as the TPM chip, which validates that all firmware and nothing else has been compromised on the device when it's been out of ours and your control. And then finally, as the last step in our process, after we've imported all of your data and we've validated that that has been successfully performed, we uh, erase each snowball according to the NIST 800-88 media sanitation standard, which practically means we overwrite the device three times with random ones and zeros and perform a sample against that device to ensure that it has been erased. It's only then that we reprovision the Snowball and send it off to the next customer. So where can you use Snowball? Um, so as of today, um, we have Snowball available in Virginia, Oregon, um, in GovCloud, in the PDT region specifically in GovCloud, as well as um, in Sydney for servicing customers in Australia, in US West One, uh, Northern California, or the SFO region, and then finally uh, in Dublin, Ireland, um, servicing all, customer, all customers um, in the EU. So what does it cost to use a Snowball? Um, so there's a usage charge per job. And so how this works out is we define the job as the one-time use of a Snowball device. So the fee, $200 for a 50 terabyte device, 
or $250 for an 80 terabyte device. That gets you the use of the Snowball for 10 days. That doesn't count the day you receive it, and it doesn't count the day that it's shipped back. It's the 10 days in between. We do institute a extra day charge of $15 per day after 10 days of usage. Think of this like a bottle deposit. This is just to incent you to return the device in a timely fashion. Um, if you have the need and to have the device longer, that's always something we can work on with you as well. There is no charge for data transfer in. That's a standard S3 policy, as well as um, for data transfer out, we reflect our direct connect pricing at three cents per gig. This only applies in the event of an export job. For an import job, there's no additional fees. Um, and then, of course, the shipping, you do pay the shipping. That varies based upon where you're shipping it to, as well as the shipping speed that you select, either one day or two day. Um, but those are standard UPS rates. And then finally, S3 capacity um, and usage fees apply as we're just moving the data with the Snowball service on your behalf into your S3 buckets. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Tom, who's going to talk to you about the second method. Thanks, Eric. Let's just check. Can everyone, is, uh, am I up? Okay, great. Thanks, my name's Tom Johnston. I'm one of the pro part of the product management team at S3. I'd like to recognize there's some uh, other Amazonians here involved with uh, building Amazon S3 transfer acceleration. Can you guys raise your hands just so people know to ask you questions later on? Okay, thank you and congratulations. Data can also get to the cloud over the internet, but the farther the data has to go, the more variable the results. So how can you get control over that? First, quick show of hands. Um, how many people have moved data across continents? So for example, you have data coming from Chicago going to somewhere in Europe or Asia, okay? How about data coming from Europe or Asia to here? Anyone doing that? Cross continent, say US East Coast, US West Coast? How much variability do you see typically when you're doing that, say going to Europe? A lot, a little? A lot, anyone else? Okay. So what we're going to show you here is in response to other customers just like you saying, hey, you know what? We'd like to have less variability and higher speed. So we'd like to both improve the alpha, our speed, and reduce the beta, reduce the variability that's going on. But optimizing internet performance is very challenging. It's challenging for a bunch of reasons. You may have high internet bandwidth. So think of that as having lots of lanes on the Eisenhower but all of a sudden your traffic is headed to Iowa, and in Iowa you don't have many lanes. It's not, once you get to the public internet, you can't control everything that's going on, You're, and you are susceptible to any weak link along the way. The second thing is, is that what's been done so far to fix this can be very complicated. Now sometimes that comp those complications are worth it because the results are great, but sometimes they're not. For example, some, some solutions you have to put software on every single client that might be initiating the transfer. Now, hey, if there's one client, not too bad. If there's 5,000 and those grow with every user, that's a problem. Uh, they may require an upfront fee. They may require custom configurations, and they're off proprietary and won't work if they're not matched properly. Uh, the expense can, by the way, be on the orders of dollars per gigabyte for some of these solutions. So when our engineers thought about, hey, what can we do to improve this? You know, we focused on the typical things that Amazon does. How can we solve the customer's problems? Let's make it easy. Let's make it performant. Let's make it brain dead simple to use. And let's not, let's charge a fair price for it. We think we have a winner here. So Amazon S3 transfer acceleration is typically uh, much faster, 50 to 400%. Now, your mileage will vary, and I want to be up front. The further you go, the more likely you are to see a bigger increase. So if you're going from, say, Brazil to Singapore, you're much more likely to see an improvement than if you're going from Chicago to St. Louis. By the way, there is a Cardinal fan in the audience. Be kind to him. Now, the next thing, we want to make it simple. So we're, we're asking you, don't change your code. Just change your S3 endpoint. That's all it takes, and that and checking a box. It works with 54 edge locations, 
uh, that Amazon Web Services has all over the world. So there's probably one near you. You don't have to change your firewall rules, and you don't have to load any client software. So going back to our criteria, it's easy. It's not complicated. We use standard TCP, which we'll talk about in a minute. And as you'll see, the pricing is very reasonable. Now, how does it work? Uh, you can see an uploader is here going to the S3 bucket. And this is how you would normally do it. You're going from, say, in this case, it looks like India to US East. And that's the normal path something would take. With S Amazon S3 Transfer Acceleration, you first upload to an AWS Edge location, which then forwards the traffic to the AWS region using optimized throughput. Now, this uses standard TCP and HTTP, uses standard optimizations for HTTP and TCP to improve the performance. We'll talk about those in a second. So let's take a look at our traffic flow. Um, the client's request to use Amazon S3 Transfer Accel Acceleration first hits Route 53. That's our DNS service. This resolves the accelerated endpoint to the POP that has the best latency. So we'll find the POP that's best for you. From there, S3, uh, S3 Transfer Acceleration will select the fastest path to send data over persistent connections to our EC2 proxy fleet in our region using HTTPS for security. And we'll go to the same region that your S3 bucket is in. We'll adjust and maximize the send and receive windows here to maximize your utilization of the available bandwidth. And then it goes directly to S3. So you get optimized routing, you get TCP optimizations, and you get persistent connections. All of these turn into much, much faster performance. You can see the diagram here on, uh, as to actually what happens. So again, uh, section one, go up to route 53. We then upload to the edge location. We then go to EC2 proxy service and then to the S3 bucket. Four easy steps. OK, now how much, how fast is it? How much time can you save? OK, your mileage is going to vary. So again, if you're, this, what this graph shows you is the uh, time it takes to do a 500 gigabyte upload from various edge locations to a bucket in uh, Singapore, in our region, an S3 bucket in Singapore. The blue line, the blue bar, is the time it takes in the public internet. The orange bar is the time it takes using Amazon S3 transfer acceleration. So the greater the difference between the two bars, the more speed improvement you're going to see. And what you can see, starting on your left, that's going from Rio de Janeiro to Singapore, going from Warsaw, New York, Atlanta, Madrid, Virginia, Melbourne, Paris, LA, Seattle, Tokyo, or Singapore. As you get closer to Singapore, you're going to see less improvement. So for example, Tokyo shows relatively little improvement for S3 transfer acceleration over the public internet, whereas something out of New York or particularly Brazil is going to see tremendous improvement. So if you're going cross-continent, you should see a real increase. Uh, you may not see much of an increase or no increase if you're immediately adjacent to the region you're headed to. Now, what are some examples of customers who have used this? One example is Frame.io. They're a video editing and collaboration company. They allow globally distributed professionals to work to collaboratively to edit videos in the cloud. The ability to get the content uploaded to the cloud is critical to them, because the more quickly they get it done, this shortens the time it takes for collaboration to start and happen. And their quote, as you can read, we have customers uploading large files from all over the world. And we've seen performance improvements of in excess of 500% in some cases. I'll take that. Another example is Huddle. Huddle is a video analytics company. Uh, they're used by professional amateur sports teams to create, edit, and share videos. Coaches use this to improve gameplay and recruiting, and for recruiting. Again, they want to get their videos uploaded quickly to analyze footage and uh, make changes if necessary. Their quote from the CTO. We loved how easy it was to get started with S3 transfer acceleration, just a simple endpoint change in our application and done. 
S3 transfer acceleration reduces the average time it takes for us to ingest videos from our global user base by almost half. This gives our customers the ability to edit and share videos sooner where speed is a critical factor. And all this for a fraction of the cost of the solution we evaluated before. The next one is VideoCorp. They're a cloud-based video platform provider headquartered in Sydney. They provide corporates and brands with an easy to use suite of solutions to reach and engage their audiences with online video. I'll let you read the quote here, but I think the story is clear. If you're moving large amounts of data, large amounts of distance, transfer acceleration is something you should consider. Now, uh, one of the things we do at, at Amazon Web Services is, is try and get things done as easy as one, two, three. I have to tell you, the team here has actually done better than that. They've got it done in two. Now, we made them put three points on the chart. I think marketing insisted on that. But uh, it's really only two. Step one is you enable S3 transfer acceleration on your S3 bucket. It's a checkbox in the console. And then you update your application uh, or destination URL to be bucket name .s3 -accelerate .amazon -aws com, And you're done. Two steps. That's all it takes. Easier than one, two, three, actually. OK, now how much will it help? To determine if this will help you, we've developed the S3 transfer acceleration, acceleration speed checker. That will compare the likely transfer speed for a given endpoint. The tools compare the upload speed of going directly to S3 without transfer acceleration and with transfer acceleration, um, depending upon where the tool is running and where you are and what region. We've talked all about that. So you can determine if S3 will give you, if S3 transfer acceleration will give you the performance benefits you desire before you turn the feature on. So this is a way to find out, hey, am I going to see the speed increase that I want? Yes or no? Now, how much does it cost? It depends on the location. Uh, data transfer in from the internet depends upon the location from where the request originated. There's no request fees and simple per gigabyte pricing. Now, one of the things we love about this is if we don't think you're going to see a benefit, we're not going to charge you. You heard me right. We're not going to charge you if we don't think we're going to see a benefit. So each time you use transfer acceleration to transfer an object, we'll check whether it's likely to be faster than a regular S3 transfer. To do this, we'll use the origin location of the object transferred, the location of the edge location processing the accelerated transfer relative to the destination and the AWS region. If we determine, and we'll use our own discretion here, if we determine that S3 transfer acceleration was likely not faster than a regular S3 transfer to, of the same object to the same destination, we won't charge you. Okay. Now the pricing uh, for the US, EU, and JP is four cents a gigabyte. For the rest of the world, it's eight. Data transfer out to the internet is four cents. Data transfer to another AWS region is four cents. And then these are on top of the standard S3 charges documented on our website already. Now, when should I use what? If you have a large infrequent upload, Snowball is probably the right service for you. If you have recurring frequent uploads, I'd encourage you to consider S3 transfer acceleration. If you have tens of terabytes from a centralized location, Snowball makes a lot of sense. If you have gigabytes or terabytes from distributed locations, S3 transfer acceleration is going to make more sense. In terms of time frame, if you, if you can take a week or 10 days, Snowballs can be a great solution. At the same time, if you have a long way to go, transfer acceleration make more, may make more sense. So with this, I'd like to invite my colleague Eric back up on stage. And he will be handling, I guess we together will be handling questions. So. Thank you for coming. Thank you for spending uh, a good part of your afternoon with us.